we have the pleasure of having Annis Dobson come and speak for us today about jumping worms. She grew up in a farm in Ottawa Valley in Ontario, Canada. After completing her PhD at Cornell, she began a position as a postdoctoral research at Yale School of Environment. Her research, her research focuses on impacts of jumping worms, white-tailed white deer, and other stressors to the native community, plant communities in the United States. She lives here in Woodbridge and can often be seen walking your dog, Emmy, along the many trails in town. And we welcome you. We're very glad you're here. And Thanks very much. Shortest distance I've ever had to travel. <laughs> Two minutes. Um, all right, so first part to get everyone warmed up is a little bit of audience participation. So um, I'm going to take a vote. Who has seen a jumping worm? So hands up for yes, definitely. OK, how about pretty sure not? And then what about maybe I saw some funky worms? I don't know. Maybe. OK, great. great. Um, and I also wanted to say that I can send these slides as a PDF afterwards if um, anybody's interested, so you don't need to take notes um, unless you have some particular thought. Um, <clears throat> so what are people most interested in learning about today? You can just shout it out or put up your hand or whatever you're comfortable with. So how do I identify them? Whether or not you have seen them. Yeah. I haven't seen them. I don't think I've seen them. But being part of Civic Beautification and Gardening Club, I want to make sure that we're not bringing things back to our own gardens or bringing it into the town gardens. Great. All right. So some hands-on. Prevention. Yeah. Yes. Prevention, application. Anybody else have any? I second the prevention. Prevention. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. I moved a couple of pots this past week. Uh -huh. The dish, yeah. and underneath them were 50 worms. Yes. So yes. I want to know if they're these kind of worms, or they yes. weren't jumping about. Uh, 50 worms? <laughs> hmm. Little. They were little. Yeah. Probably. They're little. Oh. Well, it depends how little. <laughs> you'll see. There's some videos. You can oh, see okay. if you move in. Good <laughs> measure. Yeah. So hopefully by the end you'll know. That was true. But I definitely have tons of them at my house on the beach with them. So some, yeah. So in some of the sort of landscaped houses, you'll see a lot of jumping worms in, in the entrance to trails. Once you get into the woods, a little bit less so. Um, but OK, anybody else have particular topics they want to focus on? Yeah. I'm, just inter I'm interested in understanding, among other things, why they destroy the soil. Right, soil biogeochemistry, great. <laughs> um, we'll talk about that a little bit, but I do have more to say about that. Okay. <clears throat> um, so why, why do I study earthworms? Jumping worms are a uh, family of earthworms, but I study earthworms of all the different families all around the world. Um, so growing up on a farm, it was the, you know, and for many of you that are gardeners, seeing a worm just makes you so happy. Uh, they're associated with good soil quality. Um, so why do I then want to study the bad things that they do when they get into forests? Um, and it's, the reason it's so interesting to me is that some of the same traits that make them so good in some contexts, some worms, some gardens, some places, um, are the same things that make them so destructive in other contexts. People always ask, are earthworms good? Um, but there's, there's kind of three sub-questions that you have to ask for that. So the first one being that not all habitats are the same. Um, uh, farm field over here versus this forest. The field, the plants that you're going to be putting in there um, are annuals that grow really quickly and can take advantage of rapid turnover of nutrients. And if the nutrients aren't quite right, you can amend it with fertilizer. You can change the pH as needed. Forests, they're much slower mixing. Uh, the soil mixes much more slowly, mostly done by fungi and bacteria. Um, and it's slow growing perennials that are in there that are really closely tied with uh, the other players in the ecosystem. So things like 
mycorrhizal fungi, which are the symbiotic fungi that work with plants to uh, help them get nutrients, and uh, things like ants that <coughs> move their seeds around. So the next thing is that not all plants need the same thing. Poison ivy needs something fairly different than all solids need to grow. Something like poison ivy grows quickly, it's flexible, it can grow up trees, that, like its life form is flexible, I mean. It can grow up trees, it can grow along the ground, um, and it can seek out different microhabitats if where it's growing is not great to break out. Versus uh, some of the perennials, the native perennials, the perennials that people have in their gardens um, that are much longer lived, depending on those mutualists, and have evolved to live in the duff forest floor, the sort of fluffy organic matter on the top of the forest. So the third thing is that not all worms are the same. Um, <clears throat> I do have some better pictures of jumping worms. This one shows up a little dark on here. Um, <clears throat> so we've got jumping worms. Those are newer on the scene. Uh, Lumbricid earthworms. These are things like the night crawlers that are also invasive but have been here for longer. And we also have some native worms in, uh, that have actually been collected from Woodbridge. Uh, but they, you're probably not going to have uh, met them because they are living uh, in wetlands uh, or in coarse woody debris. So they're not going to be in your, in your garden. Mm -hmm. All right, so <clears throat> um, Connecticut over here was just barely covered by the last glaciation. And so the idea is that if we had a lot of earthworms before, um, this glacier knocked them back. And they've been pretty slow to recolonize, and haven't recolonized in really great abundance. So, you know, see, any earthworm, I've seen like one in my entire life. Mm -hmm. um, but what's been happening in places like Connecticut and all around the world is that there's a subset of the 7,000 or so earthworm species that are really good at invading. It's about 120 species. <clears throat> and this is both in temperate and tropical ecosystems. So in some places, like um, <clears throat> in the UK and Australia, this is displacing native earthworms. Here, they kind of have different habitats. <clears throat> so that's less of a problem here. Uh, what's happening more often is displacing earlier invasions of those lumbricid earthworms that have come from Europe, and also invading into new habitats that really wouldn't have had any earthworms at all. So the, the forest here over on the left of Connecticut yes. would look something like this. And at the end of the season, all of those leaves that are in the trees are falling down and really decomposing really slowly. Uh, there's a couple of seats up here in the front too. Don't, don't worry about barging in, we're, we're good. <clears throat> um, and so, you know, tons of organic matter coming down from the trees, really mixing quite slowly into the forest soil. So if you've ever dug in the woods back here or something like that, you see this sort of spongy uh, organic matter and then really stratified layers before it, below that. And that um, organic horizon keeps out a lot of invasive species, keeps out a lot of fast-growing species, and so uh, it facilitates this really diverse community of plants, um, spiders, all sorts of arthropods in the soil. When earthworms of any kind move into the forest, they're mixing up, um, homogenizing the soil, so it's kind of the same all the way through. Um, and you lose a lot of the plant community and you lose a lot of the, the uh, arthropods in the soil. Um, <clears throat> so jumping worms are in the family Megascolestidae. And around here, there are three different species that look very similar in um, the genus Amethyst different than what it says on those pamphlets because the name of these earthworms, or what they should be named, is constantly changing. So it got changed back from Metafire to Amethyst like a month ago. So I had to update my slides for that, but this thing is not updated. Um, they were introduced into North America um, as early as the late 1800s, but um, these particular species, more like the 1940s. <clears throat> 
it was really interesting, and very different than most other invasive species, like the beech leaf disease that you know showed up and now all of the trees in town are hit. Really, really didn't move very much for a really long time. It's just over the last 10 or 20 years that their population has um, really exploded. And they didn't even make it into Canada for over 100 years. They, they have now been discovered there. Really, really slow moving. All right, so. So this is more or less what their movement looks like. Sorry, this is my colleague Brad. And this is the, um, the density that they can get to in the forest in some places. Mm -hmm. So the way that they move along the soil is a really, really good indicator of the movement. So what do you think? Have you seen them? Yes. Yeah? Maybe some people are a little bit more certain. So we've been talking about these sort of three different contexts, the uninvaded soil, your historical Connecticut soil, tons of leaves here building up, lots of organic matter. Some of this is 100 years old, 1,000 years old, some of it, some of the carbon that's in there. Um, lots of roots, lots of fungal hyphae, and then these really stratified layers. What is that, a cross-section cut through? Yeah, yeah, so sorry, this is like if you dug a hole and you're looking at, like, this is the top of the soil, you dug a hole and you're looking at the side profile. Mm -hmm. um, and then this is the lumbricid invaded soil, so like I said, totally homogenous as you go deeper and deeper into the soil. You lose the duff, you lose the roots, you lose the plants up there, and all of the other little critters. Um, and with jumping rooms, it's really hard to get this soil profile because um, the soil gets turned into these really crumbly pieces that are kind of like, uh, maybe for the young people in the audience, nerds candy. Have you ever done that before? Yeah. Okay, or the older people in the audience, muesli cereal. <laughs> Right? Uh, so kind of like coffee grounds, this really crumbly, gravelly soil that is very hard to take an actual picture of. Um, but that builds up in kind of the top six inches, top 12 inches of soil. And that's really the problem. It's not the worms themselves. Um, it's the density that they get to and the fact that they can transform something like this into something like this. Mm -hmm. A little bit like an up close, up close and personal picture of what we're looking at here. Has anyone seen this soil? Even if you haven't seen a worm, this is like classic jumping worm soil. You can sort of even stick your hand right into it. You don't even have to dig. It's just like. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing I want you to notice is that all of these little seedlings that have tried to germinate have just dried out um, and died. So quite often, in some of the places I work with, there's lots and lots of jumping worms that are just nothing at all um, germinating in the forest floor. So it's that mixing and the mineralizing of the organic horizon. And then when you lose the duff, the soil dries out really quickly. You can imagine trying to, a plant trying to grow in gravel, dry out really quickly. Uh, it's going to heat up really quickly. And if there's a rain event, it's going to erode really, really quickly. Um, it's got reduced carbon storage, so carbon being released into the atmosphere. Um, and yeah, this is this is kind of what the pieces look like. Just a few so some of the other impacts um, in New York City and some of the other places that I've been working with infrastructure. Um, some of the stormwater drainage is really impacted as those castings erode and clog up the culverts. Even, uh, I've been working in the Catskills, the, uh, it's New York City's drinking water, so they're concerned about what happens when these pellets, jumping room castings, move down into the water um, and affect New York City's drinking water. Uh, fields are a big one, really quite destructive to grass. And when you start to get jumping worms, what you see is along the path, you start to see this kind of dying grass and then really crumbly soil that peters up a little bit. That's kind of a 
<coughs> sign of jumping lines. And what I focus on is what this means for plants. So really tough to germinate in this. And if you do germinate, your roots are going to dry out pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. And even if you can get your roots to not dry out pretty quickly, it's really, really unstable. So if you've ever pulled, if, do you guys do the garlic mustard pulls at a brewery around town? So you'll notice the garlic mustard and Joby Romero is just pull it out. Like, so easy. Just very, very little um, rooting. It's not just garlic mustard, it's all the things that are trying to remove. A little bit of a deep dive into having the impact by communities. Uh, and this information is coming from um, some work that I've done in New York City. So along the x-axis, this is just a metric of all of the other different human impacts that there are for these plant communities. So things like um, trash dumping, and proximity to paths, proximity to playgrounds, all sorts of things like that. And then what we're actually looking at is the percent cover of native plants um, in these plots. So you can see that it doesn't really matter if you're dumping trash. Um, the proportion of invasive species doesn't really change, uh, of, of native species, doesn't really change as you go across there. But the difference between the two lines is really important. So without jumping rooms, you're seeing, even in New York City, um, about 25, 30% native plant cover in the plots. And with jumping worms, that's crashing down to about 10%. So, um, and a lot of that 10% is poison ivy. Um, what's kind of interesting is that this is, it's not only the percent cover, so the amount of the green stuff that is native versus uh, that is native, but also um, the richness, so the biodiversity is uh, much higher for native species without jumping worms and then lower with jumping worms. If you're looking at invasive species, the opposite is true. So jumping worm plots dominated by invasive plants. Without jumping worms, still some invasive plants, but not so many. What is kind of interesting is that the invasive species, which is, this is the number of invasive plants that are growing in plots, is actually um, negatively impacted by jumping worms. So you have more diversity of invasive plants without jumping worms. So they're responding, <clears throat> it doesn't really matter if you're invasive or native, you're still being natively impacted by jumping worms, but the invasive species are getting um, a leg up in terms of percent cover. So not all of these native plants are the same. The ones in the jumping worm plots tend to be poison ivy, and then another one that we have in Woodbridge quite a bit is Johnny Jumpsy. That's the one um, that sort of lines a lot of the trails these seeds that when they dry out and you know, sort of go along the stem, they jump everywhere. It's kind of got a cool strategy where if it is growing in an unstable rooting place, it falls over and that stem um, can then send up shoots of its own and then those fall over, they send up shoots of their own. <clears throat> so unstable rooting isn't so much of a problem for them. But then things like the trillium, true Solomon seal, a lot of those native perennials, uh, they have evolved to live in those that high organic matter duff soil. So they've got big storage organs that are really, really important, um, and they don't root very deep. So the strategies that they have for rooting are just, they don't mesh well with duff animals. <clears throat> but, Forests like we have here, it's not just jumping worms, right? There's other things going on. Uh, we've got lots of white tailed deer. <clears throat> um, that those populations have really grown as we've gotten rid of predators, uh, as we've changed the landscape. So, in Connecticut, was once uh, pretty deforested, lots and lots of farm fields. It's uh, now, I actually don't remember, closer to 50%, more than 50% forested. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's these pretty uh, edgy forests, right? So a deer can hang out here and get its really good food um, in the agricultural fields, really nutritious food, and then hide in the woods. So edgy habitat is very good for deer. 
And they're also just, you know, pretty good at coexisting. <laughs> so they are preferentially eating the palatable species and the largest of the palatable species. Big trillions. Um, we've got some invasive plants. So things like microstegium, this is around. Um, swallowwort is a little bit less of a thing here, but over in New York, uh, it's a pretty big problem. Um, yeah. And so I'm going to talk specifically about stilt grass. Um, and these have been shown to compete with native species in alter nutrient cycling than impacting So I take this um, multiple stressor approach where I look at the different stressors in forests individually and in combination. Um, these are two pictures from my field sites in. Uh, New York City, this one's in Queens, where you have no jumping worms, no deer, um, some invasive plants. And then this is from Staten Island. Pretty similar overstory, similar amount of light. But there's really not a lot. It's almost nothing grown here except a few patches of still grass. So why do these forests look so different, even if the light and the overstory are so different? So if you are this beautiful Solomon seal and you're growing in the woods, um, you get eaten by a deer, you've got this great strategy where you have these storage organs where you can reabsorb your nutrients and your carbon, take some time off, and then come back the next year. Maybe you'll be a little bit smaller. Maybe you won't be an adult. Maybe you'll be a juvenile. Um, but you've got that strategy. But you know, there's jumping worms causing stressful conditions in the soil deer, eating lots and lots of um, the above ground material and then invasive plants in competition. The question is, impact on native plants more than the sum of its parts. So we use deer exclosures in the places like the Catskills. New York has got this wonderful extreme abundance gradient of deer where Staten Island is just completely covered in deer. Uh, but for example, Central Park has, I think, seen one deer in the last hundred years. <clears throat> so it's a, it's a great experiment. Um, and what we do is we put out these sentinel plants um, so into the different plots to um, track how they grow. <clears throat> so now I'm going to, um, this is kind of similar plot to before. Um, over here we've got zigzag goldenrod. This is a native forest goldenrod survival. And then we've got jumping worm density here along the bottom axis. And we've also got three different colors of still grass. So 10%, 50%, and then that carpet of still grass that I showed you in the pictures. So over here at low jumping worm densities, everybody's surviving pretty well. Um, as you increase the jumping worm density, as long as you don't have stilt grass, your survival still stays quite high. Once you get to 50% stilt grass cover, this drops off. Um, but you really see a dramatic drop off at this sort of field of stilt grass cover and high jumping worm density. So they can kind of handle one stressor uh, to is where one stressor or the other, two is where the problem comes in. Looking at a different species here, this is false Solomon seal, like again, survival along that far axis. And jumping worm density again along the bottom. Um, but this time looking at deer presence and absence, you see a really similar pattern. So low jumping worms, you can handle deer. You're going to stay short, you're going to stay small, but from year to year, you'll come back. Um, it's just when you get to these high jump worm densities with high deer presence in New York City that you see actually um, within one year a local extinction of this population that hasn't come back uh, now in four years they've been, they've been gone. So it's, it's pretty, pretty, results are rare in ecology are rarely that definitive. <laughs> Um, so, some quick conclusions. Jumping worms are associated with the dominance of a small number of invasive plant species. And when combined with other stressors, jumping worms are associated with local extinction of some native plant species. 
So what does this mean for the rest of the ecosystem? I am not going to belabor this, otherwise we'd be here all night. But you can imagine if you're changing the plant community, uh, you're going to be changing the things that feed on that plant community, the things that nest in that plant community. If you lose the other, the whole food web living in the soil, that's going to have impacts that trickle up to predators. So I'll just, just leave you with that really, just a, just a little sprinkle of impacts on the food. So preventing inv the invasion. This is, this is what you came for. Um, management options are pretty limited once jumping birds are established. So there's no, oops, there is no silver bullet. So that's, that's the spoiler. So focusing on the prevention and the mitigation part. <clears throat> so to tell you um, about how they spread, I'm going to tell a little bit of a story about New York City. Uh, it's a big transportation and shipping hub, so it's all shipping routes from around the world. And so a lot of invasive species show up in New York City for the first time. Um, <clears throat> Jumping worms didn't show up there for the first time. They showed up a lot of different places at around the same time. But one of the earliest sightings was um, the Bronx Zoo. And so this is documented in Life magazine. They were really excited about this new platypus exhibit. They were bringing all these exotic things for them to eat, putting, building these cool explosions for them. Um, and one of the things that they brought over is uh, jumping worms. <clears throat> So, so if we look at this timeline, 1948, we know that they were at the Bronx Zoo, uh, but it wasn't really until the 80s that they were found outside of zoos, greenhouses, that they were found in natural areas. So they stayed pretty low. Um, in 2013, when my collaborators with the Natural Areas Conservancy looked at the woods, they found 12% jumping bird cover. And five years later, when I went back, um, it had jumped from 12 to 16. So they are one of these species that is moving really slowly, really low abundance. Something happened. So what what happened? Uh, what happened between 2013 and 2019? One thing that did happen was Hurricane Sandy. Um, so in the aftermath of the hurricane, they chipped uh, the 15,000 trees that were downed, piled them all up in one place, and then um, used it for biofuel, landfill cover, and mulch. Um, so they did all sorts of best management practices for how to make sure that they weren't spreading the invasive things that they were thinking about at the time, like Asian longhorn beetle. But jumping worms were just really not on the radar. All the mulch got piled up and then distributed out to all of the different groups. Um, so we don't know for sure that that is the answer. There, are, That is just like one hypothesis that we're throwing out there. Um, but what's really interesting, we know that the jumping worms were at the Bronx Zoo. Next door, um, we've got the theme family forest that has almost no jumping worms. Up until just a couple of years ago, they were done and a really deep organic horizon. So for everyone that's feeling really hopeless about jumping worms, this is, there's, this is right next door, and 14 million people go from the botanical garden to the same family forest every year, and they do a good job. But what are they doing differently than the rest of the city? Um, unfortunately or fortunately, they're doing everything right as far as jumping worms are concerned. So, it's an old growth forest, so not, not logged. Um, they make their own mulch on the premises. They propagate their own plants. <coughs> if they're bringing in plants, they're using berry plantings and their uh, deer eggs. So we don't really know which of these is, is um, the reason for this really healthy, intact so, uh, forest. But something in there, what they're doing is working. But of course, this is just one of many reasons that that population could spike. It might just be that 
um, the nature of the biology of them that they're growing and growing when their population slows. Um, there were also a few high moisture years between then, um, and there were a number of urban tree planting programs that they had. So, um, we don't know exactly what it is, but it does seem to be the main drivers are some combination of moisture, mulch moving, and soil moving. Um, but not all invasions are the same. The chestnut blight also showed up the first time at the rock scene. And within 20 years, it had wiped out, essentially, the American chestnut functional from the forests. Emerald ash borer moved a lot slower as it went through. And we changed some of our behaviors and stopped moving firewood long distances. And we slowed it down. People could find some trees that were resistant to the emerald ash borer. Jumping worms are on this far, far extreme of how important human mediated transport is to them. Remember? The same family forest had no jumping worms, so they're really not moving very fast on their own. It's people moving them. So small impacts that we have could have really, um, small changes that we do could have really big impacts. And this is pretty concerning because based on their um, thermal tolerances, they could, in theory, move to all of these dark gray shaded areas. So these points here, the black and the white, are places we have identified them in the past, but they could really move really long distances. So soil and mulch are the two big ones. Um, the cocoons do seem to move along waterways, so the cocoons are another word for the eggs uh, in the castings. Moving compost, uh, dumping yard waste, and then this is kind of in order, decreasing importance. Um, tire treads do maybe spread them a little bit. They, not too many people use them for bait. Boot treads, in theory, could move them, but doesn't seem to be the main thing. So thinking about soil and mulch, uh, kind of the two key things. So you want to think about where are your sources are. Um, commercially available mulch, no, commercial, commercially available compost is supposed to be heated, heat treated, uh, but jumping worms can potentially reinvade after that. So I would really encourage you to, um, if you're buying compost or topsoil, things like that, if it's in small amounts, just leave it in your car in the hot sun for a few days. Um, if it's a really big area, you can solarize it with some uh, clear plastic. You just need to get that temperature up. Um, ideally, up above uh, 104 Fahrenheit, if you can get it higher than that, then you don't have to do it for quite as long. But one thing that, that I did when uh, United, United Illuminating was coming through and cutting the trees, I just, I weighed them down and I was like, can I have that mulch? And they were like, great, I have to pay to get rid of it otherwise. So it was the mulch from my street, Beach Road, um, that I got straight away. So mulch itself is not the problem. It's when, it, it's when the mulch goes from the truck to a pile to your yard. That's the problem. So if you go straight from tree to truck to your yard, that's great. So it's just <laughs> making sure that it's not spending a lot of time in the pile. <clears throat> um, planting bare root can be really effective. So you don't need to treat jumping worms like something like um, COVID. It doesn't need to be sterile when you move things because the, the eggs are visible to the naked eye. So as long as you don't have big clumps of soil attached to the roots, then you can be pretty sure that you're not using jumping worms. Um, if, you, if, if that's not feasible, like some species, you just can't do big root, obviously. Um, paying a little bit of attention to the soil as you pull it out of the pack. So this is an uninfested tomato plant. Um, this is a pro-mix potting soil. Um, it just looks like pro but those little granules of nerd's candy or gravelly uh, bits you can see in the pot. So just being cognizant when we plant plants can make a big difference. Um, for those of you doing things like plant sales, uh, this is a bit of a time-intensive thing, but if 
plant sales or plant swaps, things like that. You don't need to not do them. Um, but if you can do something where you either, if, if people know they don't have jumping worms, that's great. But if they do have jumping worms, um, having them do this sort of washing procedure where they rinse the roots and then repot into clean potting soil um, can stop the spread of jumping worms. And then the thing that you just need to think in that place where you've done your root washing, um, strain it. The solids are where the jumping worms were, so this, this liquid you can just toss out. Uh, the solid, you want to freeze it. Actually, uh, the solid, you probably just want to throw it. Heat it or throw it. Trash, not, not outdoors. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. If you, if, you, if you heat it a little bit, they're not, cold doesn't really kill them. So heat, they're very sensitive to heat, though. And if you need to um, set out your plants, just making sure that they're not, like jumping worms can climb up table legs. So just something simple like a little cone on the legs can stop them. So they can climb like vertically, but they can't climb like underneath the back. Um, the cool thing about studying this is people send you wild pictures like worms um, outside of a second story house, like window outside of a house, they had climbed up, it was kind of like a stucco siding, and the worms climbed all the way up to the side of the floor. So they can climb. <clears throat> um, so top-down solutions are pretty difficult to implement. Um, a number of states do have laws against selling jumping worms. Connecticut is not one of them. But they have found it pretty hard to actually uh, get those laws implemented because they're hard to find, hard to identify, um, and part of the law is that you need to be knowingly selling them. Which is uh, if you've got logging or landscaping contracts, uh, making sure that the vehicles don't look like this with big amounts of mud in the tires. Um, there's something called clean. Clean Play Go, something like that. The North American Invasive Species Management Association has a program uh, where they have like contracts that you can download uh, that uh, that you can use if you're getting like landscaping or blogging people to just make sure they're doing things like having clean tools, having clean uh, equipment. Um, making sure, if, if you're composting with worms, making sure that they're the right composting worms. So these, these are like the classic compost worms, and they have these yellow stripes, tiger worms. Um, jumping worms don't make a very good compost. I mean, they eat a lot of things, but certainly not an indoor compost. Um, yeah, so making sure that you have that, the red wiggler species. Not dumping infested yard waste into natural air. A little bit of <laughs> um, I'm going to skip over that so that we have a little bit more time to discuss. Learning to recognize the signs. So, um, jumping worms are around now, they're pretty small, but it, in the winter months and the late fall, you're going to want to be looking for the soil. They're annual species, so they're not around year round. So, looking for this granulated soil that looks different from the European invaded soil. And, and at this time of year, you can start looking for the jumping worms themselves. And they're going to be right at the surface. Um, they're, by the late summer, they get pretty big, about as big as a worm gets. And the only thing that's big like that is the night crawler. So telling the two apart, you've got a few different strategies. So the behavior is one. The jumping worms skate across the soil, like you saw in that video earlier. But if you can actually get your hands on a worm, if you want to get then you could do a few other things. So they're both pretty darkly pigmented, but the, the nightcrawler, it's living in these deep vertical burrows and just kind of popping its head out once in a while. So the head is darkly pigmented, but the tail is really quite pale. Versus the jumping worms, they're kind of dark pigmented all the way through. Pretty metallic and shiny and kind of, kind of beautiful. <clears throat> Um, once they become mature, you can look for the flotella, that's this band here and here. 
in the jumping worm, it's going to be really close to the nose of the jumping worm, versus in the night crawler, it's much closer to the middle. And then the, the night crawler also moves along the surface by flattening its tail. It's called the beaver tail. So if you see this kind of flattened tail, then you're pretty sure that that's a night crawler and not a jumping worm. You can identify them to species. I'm only leaving this here, not for you to read it, but in case anybody wants this information from the PDF. Um, you can also log your observation with jumping worms. I always use this when I'm starting an experiment. Uh, we use it to understand the movements, so this is, this is really useful to me. Uh, seek can actually identify jumping worms, not to species, just a family. But has anyone ever used seek before? Mm -hmm. This is cool. This is really cool. So it's iNaturalist, uh, but it's like AI generated information from iNaturalist. And so you can hold it up to a leaf, to an insect. Like it can get, it can ID spiders to species. Um, and I really never thought that there would be an app that could actually identify plants and put me out of business, but uh, this one is, is great. And, and great for kids and families and stuff too. And great for me, because then I have that information. Um, we, we are working on a silver bullet solution. Um, probably not going to be a totally silver bullet solution, but something better. So things like uh, chemical control in smaller areas. There are some organic chemicals that seem to be effective, like saponins. So if you've ever cooked quinoa, it's like the bubbly detergenty stuff that comes up on top. So that seems to kill them. Uh, but even though it comes from seeds, it still potentially has some impacts on uh, aquatic species. So I'm not yet ready to recommend this necessarily, especially not in the woods. Um, there's some potential fungal biocontrol of this commercially available fungus that seems to be pretty effective. But we have to test the effect efficacy on non-target uh, species. So remember all the way back to the beginning, this native earthworm is pesky, rare, probably should be on the endangered species list. People don't know anything about it, earthworms that we have here. Uh, really complicate what we can do. So currently no recommended chemical or bio biological but there's other kind of mitigation things. So how do you label jumping worms once you have them? Um, you can get to like over 200 Fahrenheit by solarizing your, um, your soil. That's going to kill all the jumping worms. All the things. They will eventually recolonize, um, but, in, uh, but it really knocks back the population in a big way. Uh, if you're maybe working in like a Farm environment, soil steaming can be really effective. That's just literally steaming the soil. Uh, but you do need to think about the time of year that you're doing this. So doing it now is the time to do it. If you're doing it into the July, August, September, the worms are big enough that they're just going to escape and then come back. So managing the things that you can. Um, maybe you can manage the invasive plants. Maybe you can fence some really important um, trillium populations from deer, uh, managing some of those things that we know interact with jumping worms. Uh, cultivating deep-rooted species, so the jumping worm impacts are really in the top layers of the soil, so lots of, uh, there are lots of native plants that have really deep roots that you can think about, especially these pollinator and prairie gardens. Not really that good for forests, but if you've got like your yard and you want to plant native plants, trilliums aren't doing so well, maybe you're going to move over to more of a pollinator yard. And a lot of these have really deep rooted species um, that both can withstand jumping worms and do seem to um, limit their population growth. Plus, all of the other good things that pollinator gardens do. Can you, can you name some of those species that are in that picture? Yeah, let's see. Good, good. So we got we got uh, black-eyed Susan. Uh, I know Joe Pieweed is a good one if you've got kind of wet spider species. Um, 
Some of the milkweed are good, some of the asters are good. Mm -hmm. well, I think this might be a loop. <laughs> Which I guess is not native, but how are their roots? They do roots. Yeah. These are actually just pictures that I took or that I took from pollinator gardens, not that these species are necessarily the right ones. But yeah, a lot of the native prairie grasses have really good deep roots, sedges. We're trying to come up with, with a list that we can actually give to people um, with some combination of big data approaches and natural history. Um, but right now, it's just kind of random things that we found seem to withstand them. So Jack in the Pulpit, we got a lot of that. Uh, they've got really good chemical and physical defenses. Trout lily can sort of suck itself back into the, the soil, into the deeper soil. And some native ferns, like Christmas fern, can withstand jumping up pretty well. Not exactly sure why. Remember, poison ivy did great. It was a great native species. Feeds the animals, feeds the birds. But that's probably not going to be what everybody wants to plant. But things that are like poison ivy, other ground cover type things. Um, this is a partridge berry. Things that don't need to necessarily root, things that can kind of cruise over the surface and root here and root there. Those can be good options if you've got sort of more foresty, shady areas. Right, so that is mostly what I had. These are the, some of the partners and some of the funders of this work. Um, and I can definitely take questions. Yeah, and I think that if people need to leave, Feel free to go, but I can stick around for as long as needed. Yeah. Um, if these come from Asia mm -hmm. and they live in Asian ecosystems, mm -hmm. how are they not a problem there? Oh, great question. Do I have the slides for that? No, I didn't need them. Okay. Um, so in Asia, they have hundreds of species of this family. So they've got like over 300 jumping birds. These three that we have are only in the ditches. They really disturbed habitats there. They've got other, they've got other jumping worms that live in low abundance but outcompete these guys in their forests. Mm -hmm. And what's really cool, Japan, we've got some collaborators there. It's a lot of the same genera of plants. So they've got trillium, but it's a different trillium. They've got um, like lycopod, like but a different lycopod. And so, and they, they are doing really great. And if you dig down into the soil, there is that um, structured soil too. So it seems to be some kind of competition thing, um, that there's lots of competitors there. So these three species can only manage to grow in like really disturbed areas, but there's none of that competition here, so they are treated to the woods. It's not definitive, but that's kind of the leading hypothesis, yeah. Does anything eat them? Do birds eat That's them? it, yeah. I mean, so actually, doing? everybody eats them. Um, people always think that invasive species, mm -hmm. that the main thing driving species invasions is lacking predators. Mm -hmm. But that's only one of many, many ways that things become invasive. There's like 28 different hypotheses about it. Um, so everybody eats them. They don't eat a lot of jumping worms, but I've heard people's chickens eat them. If people that have done like dissection of bird stomachs, they eat them, fish eat them. Um, they do have some ways of getting out of that. They can like, drop their tail, they can spray some yellow toxic liquid. Um, but it seems like the predators that they have are just not enough to handle the number of eggs that are hatching every year. So uh, th that's why predators as a biocontrol option, I don't have a lot of faith in that because yeah, there's already lots of things that eat them. So add a few more predators, what's that going to do? Other problem with that is that they bioaccumulate metals. So in places where there's like lots of metal in the soil, um, 
to if you're trying to get native birds to eat them, for example, then that's going to be a big problem. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, actually, you So in April or so, it rains and there's tons of worms on them. Mm -hmm. Are they any kind of worm? No. So the, if they're in April in the rains, uh, that's probably going to be the gray worm. So that's Aparectia calidosa. Uh, and it is uh, also invasive from Europe, but um, and also a big problem in forests, but not so much a problem in gardens. Mm -hmm. But those are the ones that tend to get stranded on the sidewalk. And in April, these guys are like probably not even hatched, maybe teeny tiny. They are annual, so they don't live all year round, except maybe this year. <laughs> There's a I just got a picture from Brooklyn where they're actually mature already. In other years, they would be like barely hatching. Mm -hmm. This is such a crazy winter. Yeah. I uh, just wonder. I had heard or read that uh, mustard powder or mustard in uh, liquid. I mean, you put it in water and pour it. You could chase them. Yes. Or kill so them. Um, this misnomer is kind of my fault uh, because this is what we do to sample them. We pour it in a small area, but you need like. Um, quarter cup of ground mustard for half half meter by half meter and that's just to sample them. Mm -hmm. So it's not going to be something that you can really do to And that just gets them to rise out of the ground. Get them to rise out of the ground. So it is a way to sample them. And if you have like a little raised part because it oxidizes pretty quickly, so it doesn't hurt the plant plants growing there. Um, but as far as like a big solution, uh, probably not a great solution. Does it hurt them? It irritates their mucous membrane. So I don't know enough about worm physiology to know what their pain tolerance is. But I just might, if you're bringing them all to the surface, yeah. does it affect the ones we want to keep? Oh, well, the ones we want to keep are probably not just randomly living in the woods, in the soil. They're living in, like, deep in, like, bogs, like, wet, understanding water, or in a dead log. So random soil worms, almost certainly not. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so with the two questions. One is if we see jumping worms, I see them at a neighbor mm -hmm. down the road about a mile. Mm -hmm. um, they have some there. I don't think I have mm -hmm. seen any on my property. Mm -hmm. I understand about solarization for everything. Like if, you, if you're digging around, you see one. Of time? Yeah, yeah. So, that mm -hmm. so that is a question for you and your ethicist friends because killing them doesn't really do much to stop them. People have done experiments where somebody told me that she pulled 50,000 jungle worms out of her yard one year and it didn't. So, is killing one worm and the suffering of one worm? Mm -hmm. I don't know. That's that's up to you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but my other question is: I know that the the most harm that they're causing is in the native forests mm -hmm. or in forests to native plants. But um, do they preferentially look for forest versus? garden, open space? Yeah. So I will say that a little bit of that is the bias. That's what I study, so that's what I kind of focused on. But gardens are definitely... Could you repeat the question? Oh, the question is, um, are they mostly a problem in forests because they're seeking out forests? Or, or why are they mostly a problem in forests? And so I wanted to say that, um, yeah, so mostly I talked about forests because that's what I study. But um, big problem in perennial gardens of any kind. So, um, like, Fruit producers, like blueberry producers, are asking for help. Um, golf courses are a big one that are struggling with this. Um, yeah, perennial, like, like landscapers, landscape gardens are negatively impacted. But I do think that the forests are worse because plants that we have, like I popped up that picture of the trillium root, it's so small. They've put their strategy into things like mycorrhizal, uh, partnering with mycorrhizal fungi, not having deep roots and getting their own nutrients. With jumping worms, that's just a losing strategy. Um, 
And there's also so much organic matter for them to use. So it is kind of like an olive oil. And we're not plowing the forests. And plowing is kind of, it warms the road like that. So it is both that they are a big problem in forests, but that doesn't mean they're not a big problem elsewhere. Do they have any reason to leave? I mean, because I'm pretty sure I had them two years ago. Yeah. And I didn't see them at all last year. And I do the same activities that where I would have seen them. Mm -hmm. uh, so do they move through a zone? So we don't really know the answer to that. What we do know is they, in a wet year, huge explosion. And then in a dry year, they'll come back. But that doesn't mean another wet year. They oh, won't so we had to turn drought last year. So pay attention this year. And this is the year that you will know the answer to that. Because it's pretty wet so far. Okay. I mean, I don't know. That whole six inches of, yeah. I mean, I see frass or yeah. on yeah. in places. Yeah. But uh, I, I really nothing like that. So they are like um, extremely. Their diet is really flexible. So once they've eaten all the leaf litter, they move on to bacteria. They move on to the roots themselves. So compared to other earthworm species, they're pretty good at being flexible. So. This idea of reaching a carrying capacity is something hopeful for, but they do, they're kind of like humans where they can like be adapted and move on to something else um, and re engineer their ecosystem. So I'm not saying it's not going to happen. Another reason it might happen is that they're extremely inbred. Um, they are, I didn't mention this, but um, most earthworm species are hermaphroditic, but these guys. Are, these gals are actually mostly just females that uh, are cloning themselves here and here. A little bit of, re of sexual reproduction, but mostly asexually, are mostly just the same worms wow. in an area. So, so can, can you uh, say what something to rid me of any kind of guilt? Like, I didn't do anything particularly <laughs> bad or any right. practice. Right. It's just that I did buy a bag of mulch from yeah. Home Depot. Yeah. You know, you're yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I buy plants that I have. They've been here for a hundred years, and we didn't really recognize them as a problem until like the last ten years. So, if forest ecologists and soil scientists didn't know that this was going to be a concern, then a person buying mulch from Home Depot would not have known. And there are like, you know. There's mitigation strategies. And I stopped using mulch like yeah. next year but I, for different reasons. Yeah. Know, because that was the. Uh, yeah. You know what you gotta use is that like real toxic like black chemical mulch that <laughs> you never find a worm in that. Yeah. <laughs> but like black top tar. What's that? Yeah. Rubber yeah. mulch. Yeah. Okay, I'm just kidding. Yeah. No. <laughs> now I'm kind of I get you. How about red mulch? It, that's a, that's a, I think that's also the same oh, thing. Oh, great. <laughs> but it's got a, it's got a similar uh, Yeah. Could you use the mustard mm -hmm. as a test? Mm -hmm. Yeah, as a test of are there words And what's there? the recipe? Oh, the recipe. Uh, yeah, so gallon jug of water, quarter cup of ground mustard, uh, mix it up, wait 15 minutes, and then pour it on about a half meter by meter. And that will be a way that uh, you can tell if there are. Because they'll all come up to the surface. They'll all come up to the surface, yeah. In how much time? Right away? Right away. Oh, much, okay. Yeah. Yeah. But you can usually see the, the castings, the, the poop on the surface, even without doing that. The kind of reason to do that is you want to see what other species you have to. Yeah. yeah. You said you can put identify them when you're washing them. Roots or whatever. Mm -hmm. Do you have any pictures of what the what the eggs yeah. or the cocoons yes. or whatever look like? So they look very much like a piece of slow release fertilizer, about that size, about that shape. Uh, so as long as there's like imagine Osmocote. All right. Mm -hmm. As yeah. long as there's nothing big enough to have a hiding piece of Osmocote. So this is not super helpful, but uh, so like half a quarter of a centimeter or so down to maybe two or three millimeters. Mm -hmm. But yeah, they're just round, kind of like looks exactly like 
schools. Yeah. And the other thing, oh, just yeah. one other thing, the, kind of the life cycle, the, the months that they are born and... Yeah, yeah so, so uh, this is what we had before, that they would be hatching at the beginning of May, uh, and then maturing at the beginning of July, and then disappearing at the end of October. This winter, it was super warm, there were, this was extended into January. Mm -hmm. This was extended here. Like they're mature in Brooklyn now, mm -hmm. at the end of May. So, you know, they're annuals. They do still die every year. But uh, this is what we have in an average year. This is not an average year. We're going to learn a lot this year. And do they clone themselves at certain, I mean, does one become 300 or is... Uh, I think become one becomes about 80 or 90. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's not, it's not actually a huge number, but they're very good at surviving. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they live in water as well. Do they live in water? They can survive in water, definitely. They can I swim. saw some in bottom of the pond yeah. once. Yeah. They were all sort of like in, milling around. In my master's thesis, I was growing plants and I was like, oh, they come up onto the sidewalk and they die in the, because they would die when the rain infiltrates their burrows, right? Everybody knows that. Wrong. That's not why they come up to the surface. So all of my plants got infested with worms because I just had them like on pallets with a little bit of water. So if they can get through water, no problem. Come up to the surface because that's um, they dry out quickly. So that in the rain they can really expand, move, and uh, mate for some species. Mm -hmm. so they they don't come up because their burrows are flooded. As it turns out, they come up to mate. That's some species. Mostly they come up to move because it's much easier to move over the wet ground than through the ground. Uh -huh. so it's the great migration. Yeah. So that one is an easy one to answer. Um, we've got these one meter by one meter quadrats. Um, and we've got four of those each in 1,200 plots throughout the five boroughs of New York City. So you have that uh, quadrat and you look down and you've got a grid and so you say it's 20% invasive species, it's 10% native species. 10% Ten, of the Spots. Yeah, uh, yeah, like an aerial view. Um, so it's a little bit like you know. So it's not the density in a particular unit. It's it's, it's like which you divided it up. And it's kind of like it's a picture, and so like the pixels in that picture. How many pixels are from invasive versus native plants? Um, there's slightly different ways to do it, but essentially that's it. And so it's from these pretty small plots. And it's understory vegetation, so not trees, not big shrubs. <clears throat> and, and why do the invasive plants do better? Yeah, so I would say that I don't fully have the answer to that yet. This, this is kind of like the first snapshot, bird's eye view. Is there any association between jumping worms and native plants? I mean, maybe the invasive plants are the things that are benefiting the jumping worms. Maybe it's that there was a big logging truck that came through and distributed both the jumping worms and the invasive plant seeds. So um, that's the next thing to get at. I think it's probably a little bit of all of those things. Um, and I think that a, a lot of invasive, I think that the, that duff, forest duff, really keeps out invasive plants. And so when that is lost, then there's this big rush of nutrients. And so the things that are really good at competing in those high nutrient environments um, tend to be invasive plants and so they, they can come in. So I think that that's probably the main thing, but yeah, I would not say that we've, anyone has done the research to say this is what it is. Thank you. Cool. All right. Well, thanks for your great question. Thank you. I just wanted to say that there's a handout here if anybody hasn't gotten it and wants it.
please. And also, you can tell people that this is going to be on the town website, and people can look yes. at it. Okay. Have other people look at it.